So let's give it up. Let's give a round of warm up applause for Dr. Stephen. First, a little about me. Um, I grew up in Western North Carolina, and I had lots of chronic conditions as a kid. Um, everything from uh, asthma to allergies. I used to break out my eyes on my body like this big, um, and the doctor was always able to throw presents on that. Um, and ultimately, ended up with autoimmune type 1 diabetes, um, and so that heavily predisposed me to heart disease, hence my interest in the heart uh, and what I've been researching uh, on that. Um, and that's why I wrote this. Second book, so it's all been misconceptions about the heart. Uh, I got an undergraduate degree uh, from UNC Asheville uh, and then Dr. Chiropractic, uh, Master's of Nutrition and Functional Medicine from Washington State. Uh, I practiced for about 11 years. Uh, I practiced in Ireland, which is the whole story, uh, in South Carolina, and I've been in Virginia for the last six years. Um, and so during those 11 years, though, I had a lot of, um, I don't know, unfortunate associates with the heart uh, that weren't the best. And you know, I worked with people who, had, who ran a lot of bad business, businesses, um, and that was, uh, was hard for me. And I got kind of disillusioned with chiropractic. I was like, this is what I have to do to be a chiropractor, and I don't want to do it. Um, and I, I kind of lost sight of uh, philosophy, because Washington State didn't get much philosophy. Uh, and I kind of you know, lost what I was doing and why I was doing it. That isn't working, you know? Um, but I'm someone who wants to understand why. So I, that's why I read this book. Like, I wanted to understand why Heart disease is a thing, and why I should associate it, and led me to all these things. And so um, I want to let you in on how I came back to my why today. Um, so, in addition to chiropractic, I do online health consulting, speaking, obviously, and I've written these two books. And then, yeah, there's Ireland down there. There's castles and sheep. And <laughs> they got Guinness there, too. You know, I don't think, but, you know, that was a thing. I used to ride my bike by the Guinness factory to work every day. Okay. So, anybody know who said this? Who's the cousin? Seek first to understand and be understood. Um, he wrote a great book, I highly recommend. Um, and then, I got excited when I, when I was asked to speak here. I was like, okay, I'm gonna tell him everything in my book. Um, I'm gonna lay it all out there. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna tell him why cholesterol is not the cause of heart disease, what actually causes atherosclerosis. I'm gonna tell people that the heart is not the main mover of blood in the body, and that there are other mechanisms by which blood moves. Um, and that it's interesting that as cancer rates rise, heart cancer seems, is still the lowest, uh, or it gets the lowest incidence of, of cancer. Why is that? Maybe if we learn why that is, we can prevent cancer in the rest of the body. Um, I talk about how heart attacks can happen without a blockage. And then I talk about why and the heart gives off the biggest electromagnetic field of any organ in the body. And we're going to talk about that today, because that ends up being very relevant to chiropractic. So, I see this kind of image thrown around sometimes, um, you know, when it's kind of looking at the philosophy of chiropractic. Um, and I like it, you know, but I think it's missing something very, very important. I think that there's been a lot of focus on uh, the biochemical side of things. You know, thanks to nutrition research and, and pharmaceutical research, there's lots of focus on biochemistry. Um, but that is not necessarily how the body works. Um, we have to look at things from more of a quantum perspective, so from biophysics. Not chiropractic biophysics, but like, you know, physics of the body. Um, because without the physics, the biochemistry doesn't work. Okay? So what am I talking about with quantum? I'm talking about these things. Light, electricity, magnetism, sound, resonance, coherence. Coherence is a big word today, so remember that. So, the heart communicates in many different ways. Um, you know, through this electromagnetic field that it creates, which we're going to talk about. But it also communicates through the blood. Um, you, know, you can pick up, um, you know, the, the, the heart signal, the heart contraction, each time it beats, that, that information that travels through the blood, through the conductive, you know, um, uh, minerals that are in the blood. Um, and 
so it's not just the like electrocardiogram that it gets also sound and things like that. Um, you can pick this up anywhere in the body. You can pick it down into the foot and go into it everywhere. So I can put um, like the sensors on people's toes and use the ECG from it. So the first is the electrocardiogram and the magnetocardiogram, that electromagnetic pulse that happens. I um, mean, there's the heart sounds that travel through the blood. Uh, there's pressure information, which is always the pulse, uh, and there's temperature change, infrared radiation. So you can get all these different, you can measure all these things as the heart's communicating to the body. This is an interesting paper. Uh, when the biophysical consequences of an organized energy are considered, far-reaching implications for the role of the heart in health and healing unfold. For example, the heart, in concert with the brain, may be the main organizer and integrator of coordinated cellular function in the body. So it's it's guiding everything. Uh, it's the thing, the heart is what's guiding uh, physiology and linking everything up. So how does it do this? It does this through this giant electromagnetic field that the heart creates. Okay, how does it do this? It does this because um, it has a, a very high amount of mitochondria. It's one of the densest tissues in mitochondria in the entire body, over 5,000 per cell. And mitochondria create electromagnetic fields. So electromagnetic field is, um, happens when we get a proton and an electron that are passing, the, it's passing the protonic energy between them really fast, and that creates this magnetic field. What does the mitochondria do? It takes electrons and it passes through down this chain, and we have pump protons up here, so we have this, um, we have protons and electrons in alignment, we get this electromagnetic field. You put that electromagnetic field with mitochondria next to a bunch of other mitochondria, we have a chain of electromagnetic fields, like a coil, and that creates a bigger magnetic field, a cell. And then you got a lot of cells in one area that have this electromagnetic field, like the heart, and you get this giant electromagnetic field. You know, uh, this is the physics of it, and that's why the heart has this huge electromagnetic field that can be, that can be detected like, I think it's like 16 feet away. Um, so when I walk into your space, you feel it, right? So, efficiency in mitochondria is key for this electromagnetic field because the mitochondria will create the electromagnetic field. Um, so the heart muscle prefers fatty acids and ketones. The keto crowd is like me because I talk about heart and ketones a lot, so they pick me up. I go to keto and stuff. Um, the presence of ketones has been shown to increase mitochondrial respiration, um, but food is only about one third of how mitochondria get electrons, and this is um, this comes from a, a German scientist named Alexander Bunch, and he claims that like you know harvesting the chemical bond, chemical energy from food is only about a third of how we get electrons, and that is what we get into this environment uh, and the quantum aspect of things. So we don't want to get electron transport chain stretched out, so it's important that the electrons get passed down here, right? They jump, like Mario jumping on blocks. And if you are you play Mario like me and you're bad at it, Mario fell sometimes, right? We don't want those electrons to do that. We don't want them to pass out, but if these um, protein complexes get stretched out, um, then those protons get lost, or those electrons get lost, like lost energy. And so then that, that um, uh, electrical part, the negative part of that chain, gets interfered with, and then we don't get the electromagnetic field. So maintaining healthy mitochondria is very, very important. Um, yeah, so like, like I said, when they're efficient, they create this giant electromagnetic field in lots of areas in the body, but it's the biggest in the heart. And this is critical for communication, okay? So we know we can pass communication through electromagnetic fields, right? Pick up your cell phone and text somebody or send them an email or call them, right? That's communicating through an electronic field, electromagnetic field. And the heart can do it as well. The whole body does it, really. So what is coherence? It's healthy connections between aspects of a biological system. Okay, for example, this would be the relationship between the heartbeat and breathing. That's two things that we can draw this relationship to. They can have coherence together. However, coherence is really a hard thing to measure because it's very complex, right? You add a third aspect of that, and a fourth, and a fifth become very hard to predict um, how that's going to um, how that's going to how they're going to interact with each other. But healthy coherence is the ability to link things to intercommunicate, so that all aspects of the system are on the same page and functioning as a whole. You're able to best for the system as a whole. And this is where complex systems emerge. Um, complex systems, like things, tend to emerge the same way or properly. Um, so we're thinking about like the Arduino system and how it's just like a tree, or even like how humans make rows. We have bigger rows and smaller rows that lead to cells with the houses, the rooms and the houses. Like complex systems organize themselves the same way. Um, and this is because of coherence, and they're all communicating, they tend to organize themselves in that way. Because the heart's electric field is 60 times stronger than the brain's, and its magnetic field is 5,000 times stronger than the brain's, 
It is the only life in the night to feel large enough to touch or sense every cell in the entire body. This means the heart is what monitors the body, detects coherence, and then in turn relays coherent signals to the entire body. Heart coherence is measured via heart rate variability. We talk about heart rate variability, we, we talk about it a lot uh, in our profession. I don't think it's necessarily only measuring balance in the autonomic nervous system. I think it's that's one aspect of what it's measuring, that's one aspect of what creates coherence. So heart rate variability is measuring this coherence. Okay? So what is heart rate variability? Um, you can kind of see the book sheet because it's kind of faded, but like which one do you think is normal? Which is a normal heart rate variation? The second one. People you know, might think, oh, it's the one that's steady, right? It's normal, right? But those are all reduced hearts, heart failure, atrial fibrillation. And so heart rate variability, like normally you're supposed to have this variation between heartbeats, okay? And I, I kind of liken it to, um, well, I'll say that one right here. So healthy HRV is having an ability to react to your stress and determine how many states it. And the analogy that I give people, it's like, it's like a baseball team. Right? So if you're in Little League, like me, I'm the after to throw my little thing and being bored, I'm not being coherent with my team. Like, I'm not on the same page. Look at pro ball players. Like, they're just kind of relaxing, they're throwing the ball, and they're incoherent. But then as soon as the pitchers get ready to go, they're in athletic states. They're all on the same page so they can react to whatever happens. Right? And they can cohesively get that person out. Right? But they're on their toes. They're ready to react. Like, that's, that's healthy heart rate variability. The ability to react and then have homeostasis, which is getting somebody out. The coherent heart is a sensory organ. The senses are emotional state and communicates to the brain. It can also process information and alter its own physiology independent of the central nervous system. Neurological signals received from the heart to the brain influence the nervous and endocrine system with direct function throughout the entire body. And I really like this quote by uh, Mei Wan Ho, who this is her source down here. An unhealthy heart, by contrast, is no longer communicating, but falls back into its own intrinsic rhythm. Um, like this one here, the more regular one, rather than the altered one. Um, like a very boring person keeps saying the same thing, not listening or responding to anyone else, which is why it appears superficially more regular, even as the dynamic hidden and order is destroyed. It's pretty important stuff, right? How do we create coherence? Well, researchers have found out that you know this is incredibly linked to our emotional state. So they have six different heart rhythms that they talk about. Um, and they're all associated with these different emotional expressions, right, on this, on this chart here. And the one that creates the most coherence is love and appreciation. No, uh, no coincidence there. Um, but frustration and resentment create incoherence, okay? We're gonna talk a lot more about how emotions affect us as well. Um, but only love and appreciation create full coherence, okay? There's a reason we seem to connect our hearts to our emotional state and say things like, I love you with all my heart. We don't say I love you with all my spleen. Um, or we gave it all our heart, you know, we have this emotional attachment to it, it's a sensory organ. It's one thing the heart does. The heart does not move blood around the body, but it's a sensory organ and it has other things as well that I talked about in the book, um, but we've misunderstood its purpose and why it's there. So other ways to create coherence, the laundry list. Um, release stored or unresolved trauma. Change your perspective on feelings of frustration and resentment, which is not as bad as you think. Get nature exposure. That's all of the right things that create coherence uh, to our system, all the right signals. Uh, do some grounding, earthing. Uh, this, this place is great for that. Uh, I was in the Honolulu airport and there's spots. You can go out and ground while you're still in the airport, which is awesome. Uh, cold exposure, um, ice baths, cold showers, things like that. Um, you usually find me jumping into, into waterfalls. Uh, minimize uh, non negative EMF exposure. Minimize toxic to light exposure. Balance your state rhythm, cultivate positive loving relationships, and chiropractic. So we're going to talk about exactly how that happens. This is what led me to find my why again. So connective tissue. Let's talk about a few things first. Um, we think about it, and I, was, I originally thought about it like Spider-Man's suit, right? It's something that's kind of a layer on you somewhere that's kind of holding everything in. But that's not what it is. Um, but it has many names, fascia, collagen, nutrition, integrity system, living matrix, whatever you want to call it. It's the framework of the entire body. It's what holds us together, but it is much, much more than that. So we think of it like, you know, this collagen, this connective tissue that's kind of on the outside, 
holding us together. Like it's connecting one thing to another and holding things in place, right? Um, but it's outside of the cell or a tissue, um, kind of holding the tissue in place. We also know that we have this intracellular matrix, um, or, and um, you know, there's all these proteins that are holding things in place in the cell, right? Um, but it's the same type of proteins, these collagen proteins in the cell. Um, and research shows that um, water cytoplasm in the cell is always within five nanometers of some sort of place in there. However, it's actually more integrated than that. Like, it is everywhere. It penetrates every single tissue in the body, the bone, the nervous system, everything, all the way down to the level of the DNA. And it gets into the cells through these things called integrins, right? So this fascia goes in through here, that forms the um, extracellular matrix, goes all the way to the DNA. So it is literally connecting everything in your body, syncing us up. Now, this is a, um, a dissection of fascia by a guy named Joe Hedley, if you've never heard of him, he's a pretty cool anatomist. He's got these videos online for 15 bucks a month where he does these, does these really cool dissections. But he had, he had this tissue, I think this is like, um, like, I think it's a muscle or something, I think it was just on the side of the leg for me, the IT man. And he, he took it out and he just kind of started massaging it and he got rid of the tissue and he was left with fascia. It took forever, he kept massaging it and he had these graduate students, he's like, okay, just come massage this for hours. And he's finally left with this stuff, this, this fascia. Uh, and I wish you could see, like in the videos he has, he puts it in, he puts it in water, and you can see how interwebbed it is, and how it's not just this connected tissue thing; it's it's going everywhere. Uh, it's really, really fascinating. But I also want you to know how look how wet it is, um, how it holds fluid. That's going to be kind of important. So, hope this plays. This is a a video um, of a guy who who put like a microscope into like looking into the tissue. I think he was scrolling through the tissue group called the video, um, and it's live fascia, so this is someone who's alive, and we're looking at how the fascia moves from main to This is strolling under the skin by Dr. Jean-Claude Guimbardeau. When you see the behavior of the fascia under the water pressure, you start to understand how it is moving. Watch as the fascia tendrils of the fascia move. Imagine elasticity, surface tension, flow, and movement. The shape of these. Cool, right? I'm just moving. It's kind of almost, it's almost like, you know, Disconnects and connects to other pieces of fascia at the same time. It's like the stairs in Harry Potter, you know, they kind of move along. Um, anybody recognize this? This is the carpet in my hotel room. I don't know what yours looks like, but they put me in the yes. fashion room. I was like, man, look at this. Anyway, so, so we're told we're a large body of water, right? We're mostly water. Okay, but I don't slosh around like a water bed. Okay, I'm not liquid water. And if you doubt that, just take the tissue of your forearm, move it around. That's a gel. Right, that's like jello. I can displace it, comes right back. Okay? So, this comes from lots of different researchers Albert and Georgie, uh, Gilbert Lane, but most recently, Gerald Pollack um, has, uh, they, he's called it the fourth phase of water, where water has this. Uh, fourth phase, not solid liquid gas, but kind of in between solid uh, and liquid, and it's more like a gel. Okay, so how it forms is when, so water has the ability to hold energy, and when it does, and it gets next to a water loving surface, which all biological surfaces are hydrophilic, um, it kind of cleaves off one of the hydrogens, and you're left with this oxygen and hydrogen, um, and they kind of team up with other oxygens and hydrogens, and they form this lattice like structure, this more structure. It's also called structure of water, or um, exclusion zone water for all different names. And they kind of sync up uh, and form these like fence like panels, and then they kind of stack on each other, and it forms this layer of gel. Okay? Um, and so that hydration you see around that fascia, that's what it is, just kind of put that into here. Now, the cool thing about this water is that when it forms, when it, um, we have this layer of four phase water, it's very electronegative because the oxygen. Um, is more negative, and it's, less, it's just not balanced out by two hydrogens now, because it just has one. Um, so the, the chemical makeup is H3O2. So it becomes a very electronegative area. 
that's depicted here. And since those hydrogens that were cleaved off are over here, it becomes a very positive area. Okay, so what do you get when you get a positive and a negative next to each other? Just like in the mitochondria, we get a battery we learn, right? So that creates um, work, that can do work. So, turns out this is what's in all of our cells. Well, in healthy cells, it's all structure. Um, and it's called exclusion zone water because nothing can penetrate it. Um, the way it lines up, uh, almost nothing. Uh, the only thing that can penetrate it are small hydrated, hydrated ions and minerals. Okay, so it is actually what's contributing to this distribution of sodium and potassium inside and outside the cell. Um, there's scientists that have proven that ATP can, there's, there's no way we can make enough ATP to run sodium and potassium points. That's just, that's false. Um, what happens is we get the structured water inside that, that holds a lot of uh, potassium in and excludes calcium, or, uh, sodium. And so that's how we get this distribution. Um, and there's a whole lot of other interesting things about that when it comes to cancer. Um, but also, structured water forms itself on the lining of the artery. And those here are, are hydrophilic. Um, and since it's structured in the exclusion zone, nothing can penetrate it. That becomes very relevant with atherosclerosis. And it's also what create, creates blood flow. Okay, so this battery can create blood flow, and, and Dr. Pollock has shown this in his lab over and over again. Um, it's how the blood moves, um, which you know, folks start to ask questions well, why is the heart there? And those are things that are answered in the book. But collagen is also a hydrophilic surface, this fascia. Okay, so collagen has this triple helix. Um, those are little collagen fibers, and it has this hydrated shell on the outside. Okay, now the cool thing about this is that certain forms of energy can be transported through this. Okay, so electrons are transported on the collagen itself. Protons are transported through the structured water. So when they link up like this, so with normal water, we just have H2O floating around, you know, browning in motion like this. Um, but when they're linked up, when they're structured, protons can travel along this and get transported. They call it, like we have electricity, electrons moving, this is proticity, um, protons moving. But also, um, uh, photons, uh, light, and phonons, sound, can also travel through the system. Communication, right? This is how the body communicates. Uh, this is uh, uh, researcher James Osman. Collagen is an example of a biological semiconductor. Each double bond contributes one electron that is mobile, free to move about in the protein fabric. Since the living matrix is continuous throughout the organism, these electrons can go anywhere. Cool, right? So there's our fascia. This is a, a book uh, by Dr. Pollock. Um, he talks about the structure of water. Uh, and just like this image on the front of the book is like a, like a cross section of collagen because they, they form triple helices and then they like to you know sink up into these um, seven fibrils and that forms this collagen. Um, and so these little dots on the outside are depicting hydration of the collagen. Um, and so it's really interesting that when you put water into something, it produces resistance. So it appeared that the water was no longer interacting with the walls of the nanotube at all. Images showed that water took on a cylindrical lattice structure without contact with the conduit, but it achieved reduction, if not total elim elimination of friction and resistance to flow. So that makes this stuff really, really fast. Um, okay, so here's just uh, more evidence here. It's, it says that um, hydration of collagen is what leads to the conductivity of it, the ability to, to transport these electrons and protons throughout it. And so from 8 to 40 percent, uh, you have a six orders of magnitude of change. So it's six times more conductive going from 8 percent um, hydrated to 40 percent. Now, hydrated collagen um, uh, creates tens tensile strength. So dehydrated collagen uh, is very brittle uh, and not very strong. Um, but hydrated collagen uh, can create a tensile force of 300 times muscle contraction, the tension that's created there. When someone says they just wake up stiff, their collagen is dehydrated mm -hmm. because they can't move. Okay, we're, we're going to talk about how hydrated collagen. But this is faster than the nervous system, this communication. How fast? Photons, speed of light. Sound, speed of sound. Electricity, speed of electricity. Um, these things are super fast, um, which is super cool when we talk about chiropractic work. Um, but there's some researchers that have attributed this to like our subconscious, right? This is not conscious thought. This is how subconscious is communicated throughout the entire body, which is interesting. If you want to look into those things, it's, it's kind of cool. Um, but I just wanted to, these studies um, just showing that collagen is also interwoven into the nervous system, right? And we know that the, this collagen is communicated. So how much of the communication to the nervous system is the collagen versus, you know, 
mind if you ask if you can throw that kind of thing. So, what damages fascia? Well, Joe Headley used that anatomist I told you about. Stasis, not moving, dehydration, and inflammation. These things can damage collagen. So what happens with loss of properties of healthy fascia? We get inability to conduct. So these are some studies uh, using this um, coherence tomography where they're shining light through an organism. And here it's uh, some extra shit. It's um, cartilage of the knee. Healthy knee, you see the light passing through easily. If there's scar tissue, it starts. The light's not passing through. It doesn't conduct the light. Okay, um, and so it just it stops that communication. And then going back to the heart, what do we know about scar tissue in the heart? It doesn't conduct the signal. We like the signal to, to, to beat, right? Um, to contract. I don't say pump because that's not what the heart does. Um, but yeah, we see the scar tissue there. It doesn't. It shows us that it doesn't conduct. Now remember, um, the water, the hydration of it, and its structure within this gel state is what allows the conduction to happen. This water is what we call a liquid crystal, okay? So it's, it's not like hard crystal, um, it's a liquid crystal, um, because it's linked up in this crystalline-like formation, but it's, it's still gel, it's a liquid. Okay, and we find it in lots of different places. Um, the cell membrane, um, collagen, as we talked about, these are chloroplasts, cell and plant, um, what's the rest, mind and tissue, uh, muscle. Uh, Dr. Pollock wrote a really fascinating book about muscle and, and what it is water, and then microtubules. Um, so what happens if you shine light through a crystal? You get a rainbow, right? You get all these colors in the rainbow. Um, and so Mei Wan Ho, the Chinese researcher, he wrote this book, fascinating book. She also wrote another book called um, uh, Living Water H2O. And she developed a technique to shine light through a living thing. And she did, she showed worms. So it's rainbow and worms. She showed this light through these worms and she got these colors from the worm because they're living crystals. They're, they're um, liquid crystals. Uh, just like we are, they call them things. The liquid crystals. Liquid crystals have unique abilities uh, to interact with light, heat, pressure, sound, electricity, gamma rays, cosmic rays, microwaves, bioelectricity, biophotons. They're literally the antenna that is allowing us to interact with our world. Okay? They also have piezoelectric properties. So, what's piezoelectricity? So, when we forcefully change something, uh, we bring mechanical stress to it, we can stretch it, or we can compress it, uh, we get this charge separation. What did I tell you that happens in a charge separation? We get energy, right? Energy is created as a battery. And so the, that energy that's created in the form of electrons has creates these streaming, streaming potentials that is instantaneously transported through a conductive system like fascia. So this is just a study showing uh, fragile proteins, uh, proteins are piezoelectric of uh, the collagen, especially when they have structured wire around them. Um, and they, this is just a study showing that they can play roles in life and different things. They found that um, this piezoelectricity uh, plays roles in cellular development, uh, volume regulation, cellular migration, proliferation, and things like that. So it's important. Um, now, having the fat collagen um, leaves no space for hydration. So when we get an injury, something happens to our fascia, we deposit scar tissue. It's so tightly packed together that, hide, that the, it can't be hydrated. So it becomes dehydrated. Okay, so. Um, we get the injury, and it heals, tries to heal really fast, and we get this scar tissue, right? So this dehydrated fascia, there's no liquid crystal around it, it's not very conductive, uh, it becomes brittle, um, and uh, it's a problem, right? That's what the people that wake up on spit, right? Um, so this is just a bunch of uh, research showing that this fibrotic scar tissue occurs in the nervous system. So, this is an interesting paper, um, which I thought that these guys have um, said that various external and internal mechanical stresses lead to micro deformations in the wound milieu, which results in upregulation of transforming growth factors. <coughs> Furthermore, the mechanical strain exerted on collagen fibers and other piezoelectric tissues leads to the development of piezoelectric current in the wound site, which acts synergistically with transforming growth factor. Mechanical strain regulated the orientation of collagen fibers parallel to the skin surface which minimizes the induction of piezoelectricity through the action of internal forces because of the improper angulation of collagen fibers and these forces. So basically, when you add this mechanical stress um, to tissues, it creates this piezoelectricity that rearranges the collagen fibers to deposit normally again. Gee, there's always some external mechanical stress that you put on something, right? And that's exactly what we see. So these studies, they've measured chiropractic adjustment and they measure piezoelectric forces with a chiropractic adjustment. Uh, they, I forget, they talk about different levels that they 
um, adjusted, and they measure with these accelerometers, I think they're called. Yeah, um, hydroelectric uh, energy coming from them. And then the second study down here, um, they did, they called it osteopathic therapy, um, you know, the manipulation. Um, it's a mechanical strain that it was transduced into electric current due to hydroelectric properties of biopolymers um, to which the strain is applied. Electricity generated in such a way is conducted to other parts of the body to exert forces on distant cells, tissues, or organs. Those are instantaneous but transported into electricity, electrons that can be run. I also found that chiropractic emits light. We all emit light, okay? It's infrared light on the non visual spectrum, but strong infrared goggles, we all light up in like Christmas tree. Um, because we're emitting light. And our, bio, our mitochondria are what do that. Um, so there's just two studies here. Uh, studies that highlighted how approaches with direct articular techniques, as well as the one to or craniosacral techniques, influence the emission of photons, both locally and in distant areas from the manipulative manual application area. The second one here, they measured the amount of photonic energy. Um, and so, you know, they just adjusted one segment of time. So when they adjusted C2, 19% increase in photon emission, right? So when we're adjusting people, we're creating light, let there be light, right? And then L4, they did that, 28% increase in biophoton emission. And that's just one segment, 28%. What about this? Holy, why a photon? <laughs> okay, so also, uh, we, um, when we get a morphological change to tissue, we create a electromagnetic field, okay? Um, the electromagnetism is associated with another law of quantum physics, the non-local entanglement, which is a really fascinating thing, um, uh, entanglement. Uh, when two cells and molecules are in contact, this connection creates an unbroken microbiological, microbiological link. In this way, every cell is aware of what happens to another cell, no matter how far away, right? So this electromagnetic field that we create with our heart, but we can create with an adjustment to a morphological change um, allows for communication. Now, this entanglement thing is really, is really cool. I'm just gonna briefly touch on it. Like, so we hear about free radicals, and like, so, uh, you know, a, a molecule you loses an electron, and now it becomes this free radical. But that electron and this molecule are entangled, right, through the electromagnetic field. They're talking to each other. So wherever this electron goes, you know, it's always talking to it. So let's say this was left in the liver, and this goes to the brain. Now the brain has a sense of how the liver is feeling, right? It's really, really fascinating. There's a book called Life on the Edge um, that talks about quantum entanglement. Um, really interesting. And it opens new pathways to how our bodies communicate. So I'm gonna read you this. Our healing is done entirely by the hands. There are no drugs used. You can eat or drink what you please within reason. I disagree these days. Um, we use no electrical batteries, no instruments. Anyone can step into our treating rooms. There you will see at each a table, two stools, and a magnetic manipulator. Anybody know who said that? Yeah. Easy. Um, he was a magnetic. He used to use magnetics for healing um, before in his time in chiropractic. Just interesting that, I mean, I don't know if he used these for magnetic fields or adjustment, um, but uh, just interesting. Now, this is really fascinating. So, melanin, right, in our skin, you know, uh, it's what you know, helps us deflect the sun or whatever, um, you know, responsible for our tan. Uh, it's not just for that. It's literally everywhere in the body. It's not just in our skin. It's in the nervous system, it's in the eyes, it's, it's everywhere in the, in the body. Um, and there's different forms of it. But this researcher, um, Arturo Solis Herrera, um, has, has found that it can absorb many forms of energy. So the melanin everywhere um, absorbs light, electromagnetic fields, high electricity, sound, hits the melanin, and there's neuromelanin, there's melanin in the nervous system. And what that does is it dissociates the water molecules, releasing energy in the form of electrons. So what happens is this energy hits melanin, and then that melanin is next to water somewhere, think about the nervous system, the cerebral, cerebral spinal fluid, um, and it dissociates the water molecule into two hydrogens, the guy was talking about hydrogen yesterday, like we can create hydrogen too in our bodies doing this. Um, oxygen and electrons are released. And so the dissociation and the reassociation of water creates this uh, four electrons that we can use. Now, what does the mitochondria use? Hydrogen, oxygen, electrons, right? Uh, and we can uh, literally do this, or melanin can do this uh, when certain types of energy hits it. It soaks up that energy. Um, so this guy, this uh, Dr. Guerra um, has written these, a few different studies. 
introduction the main role of melanin in the mesencephalon, in the brainstem. Water and the cephalic spinal fluid, the main source of energy in the central nervous system. Okay, so when, you, when someone, you're adjusting somebody um, and you're creating this, this light uh, and this uh, sound which we're gonna talk about, um, this electromagnetic field is going straight to the melanin in the nervous system. It's splitting the water molecule in the field there. And the person says, I feel like I have more energy. Is that right? Because we hear it all the time. This could be a potential way as to how that's happening. They do have more energy. Um, so this is um, looking at melanin and how it can absorb sound. The sound is not just the byproduct, right? Um, so here, uh, energy really transfers between uh, phonons, molecular vibrations, heat, and sound. Um, and this over here says that melanin can even act as an antioxidant. You know, it, 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 creating these electrons, right? When it creates electrons, those can go to different uh, free radicals and, and quench them, so to speak. Um, this is fascinating. It's, it's just kind of, it's a rat study, um, and you can take from it what you want. But what they did is they found a way to create a cavitation in water, an audible cavitation um, in water. And so they anesthetized these rats who had liver cancer. <laughs> And they found a way to create this cavitation in water, which created a sound. They took that sound energy and they found a way to focus it into the liver of these rats. And it disrupted the production of cancer. It disrupted the um, proliferation of cancer with that sound. So I don't think the sound is irrelevant. I think that it is very uh, feeling, uh, the sound we make with, with the adjustment. Um, so I'm going to school right here. Don't get get to the track. And yeah, you know, we want motion in general. I think there's hydroelectricity, but the sound is pretty cool too. Um, so this study here shows that melanin uh, can absorb frequencies of sound up to, what was it, like one to six megahertz, a lot of hertz. Um, but over here, this shows that the, the, the um, hertz that we create when we adjust somebody uh, is about, you know, uh, anywhere from like two to eight uh, thousand, so, or um, two to eight kilohertz. Um, so lower than what melanin would, is able to absorb, but still able to be absorbed by melanin. So, this is kind of where we start. We adjust somebody like this. We create a hydroelectric force, right, that, that rearranges scar tissue, or can rearrange scar tissue, um, allowing for more conductive hydrated uh, scar tissue, or tissue. Um, so we create light when we do this, we do photons. Uh, electrons are created with hydroelectricity. Uh, we get electromagnetic field stimulated. And we get a sound. Okay? And all that information is instantaneously communicated through the entire body, instantaneously, like just like that, you know, um, creating coherence, coherence is communication. Um, and so the only thing that can make it better is emotions, right? Creating coherence with emotions. So this is the way that, um, you know, coherence was originally discovered to, to create coherence was with emotions, right? So there's all these. There's all this evidence for, you know, a therapeutic intention that you have, right? So if you're, you know, treating with anger and resentment, it's probably not going to get as far as you could if you're, if you're treating with uh, an attitude of healing and love and gratitude. Um, this one here, the findings support claims of energy healing via biofield awareness can be modulated both bioelectromagnetically locally and via conscious intent. Um, so I would like this quote from a friend of mine, uh, Meredith Oak. You know, the, the science is very complex, all these things we talk about, biofuel, but the application is very simple. Adjust somebody's spine with intent, right? Pretty simple. So, chiropractic manipulation induces physical change to tissue, especially scar tissue, that break up scar tissue, create hydroelectric, electromagnetic, sound, and photonic energies that are, one, communicated instantaneously throughout the living matrix, all the way to the level of DNA, creating coherence. And they're used by melanin to dissociate the water molecule to create energy and oxidant, oxid, antioxidants for the nervous system. How do we measure coherence? Remember? HRV. What do we know chiropractic does? <coughs> Increases HRV. Right? So this is, in my head, how I figured out why, how, how this is working. Um, and I had to go down a bottom to this one. Um, this is just you know very small study, just six people, but one of the one of the participants had a three hundred percent increase in HRV just through chiropractic care. I think it was like fifty, um, and then there was a maintenance after that. Cool.
cool thing about that is that HRV, increasing HRV, um, has been shown to help with autoimmunity, uh, inflammation, cancer, uh, survival, uh, cognitive performance, uh, psychopathology, mental illness, uh, cardiac issues, insulin resistance, and longevity, longevity in general. Right? So, but it makes sense when we're talking, when we think about it from a coherent perspective, right? perspective if we're creating coherence in the body, allowing it to do what it's supposed to do, of course, it's going to have an effect on these things. Because these, these are the reasons the body's not doing what it's supposed to do, but it can't. There's some interference, there's some, something happening that's just coming into the body, right? But I want to talk about psychopathology a little bit, uh, mental health. So these are the components of the pain system, okay? So we have this sensory aspect, it's these nociception, right? Where we get you know, painful stimulus, and that's communicated to these first order, second order neurons um, that will go into the thalamus, and once it hits the thalamus, uh, that tells the brain, hey, something is painful, right? So pain is in the brain, so to speak, because it's not until it gets to the thalamus that that's communicating something's painful, okay? And this is, um, this is the, the level of, of pain that opiates are trying to work. They're trying to biochemically block something along this path uh, to stop this from happening. Um, and this is a very, very old evolved mechanism. So invertebrates have this. So the only signal they have from their life is, oh, that's painful, get away from it. But they have no way to learn that that's painful in the world of the future. It's just every time it's painful, get away from it. Okay? Very, very low evolved type thing. Then we have the emotional capacity. Uh, of pain. This is the unhappy response where we cry, uh, we would change in physiology, increase heart rate and, and uh, blood flow, things like that. Um, and this is the, the thing that teaches us to stay away from this thing causing pain. Okay, this is a much higher evolved mechanism. We know that primates and higher evolved vertebrates have this. This rear one is usually for the higher evolved. Um, but then there's this third aspect of pain. Um, oh yeah, so um, the emotional aspect goes to the somatosensory area here. It's what gives us um, this you know, um, learned response. But then this cognitive part of pain um, is the capacity to worry about it. What does this pain mean? Um, is how long is it going to be here? Is it going interfer to interfer interfere with my life? These types of things. This is a frontal lobe thing. This is a human thing. Okay, This is uh, something that only humans can do. It requires you to be self-aware, self-conscious, to think about life. right? Um, and it's a very real aspect of pain. This is where we get this somatosensory um, uh, area that connects to the frontal cortex, uh, the frontal lobe. Um, that's that connection there. So um, when we think about emotion, it's creating coherence, um, which is very relevant to this cognitive aspect of pain, how we're thinking about things. Uh, and so here's this diagram that I got from this book, really fascinating book by Richard Ambron, uh, talking about pain. But we have the, um, the, uh, the um, somatosensory area where it's just like the dotted lines, you know, the, the nociception uh, going to there. And then the blocked ones are that are probably more effective. So it's being aware of the pain, it's that emotional response. Uh, so these ones go into our pain, interior cellular cortex. That's creates the awareness. Amygdala creates the fear of that pain. We don't want it again, so we stop doing it. Um, but then here, is the uniquely human part of it, where we get the prefrontal cortex, where we're worrying about it. Now we have cognition about it. And it's really interesting. Um, they studied all this, and they used to be like the lobotomies, right? And they would, the frontal lobe lobotomies, they studied all these patients, and they would get an injury, like a burn my hand like crazy, um, and they would know from past life experience that that's supposed to be painful. But they severed this, and they had no capacity to worry about it, so they didn't feel any pain. Isn't that interesting? And then, you don't have to do a lobotomy. There's this really interesting um, study that this guy did in World War II, who was an uh, anesthesiologist, I think. He had these guys coming in from the front line with these terrible injuries, and he was asking them how much pain they had, um, and he recorded the results and everything. And then later, when the war was over, he went back and he was practicing, and he was asking um, patients of surgery how much pain they had. And the difference was astounding, because the people coming in with these injuries that were less, much less controlled than the surgery and just more gruesome and everything, were reporting way less pain than the people who were getting out of surgery and saying, I had the worst pain in my life, it's terrible. The reason being is because they're thinking about it. When you're coming off the front line, you've got an injury, you're not dead, you know that injury means I get to go home. Or at least to a, you know, a time of healing or an away from the front lines, right? So it was a positive thing that totally changed the way they thought about it and pain was eliminated. Okay, so trying to block pain with opiates in this area here is never going to work because of this capacity. 
of pain. This this aspect of pain, right? Because we're never going to shut it down by pain. And what and what opioids actually work? The ones that that mess you up so much you lose cognition, right? They have to like literally change um, the way you think about it or interfere with the way you think about it until they work. And that's very addictive, okay? Um, so, but people have the power in their minds to change it, or we do. So, this is Stephen Fortress's um, diagram. He's talking about uh, polyvagal theory, where we have older evolved filosomal nucleus, that's that stress response. Um, literally, older evolved uh, animals that, that play dead. You know, you're, you're so stressed that you, um, you play dead because an animal doesn't want to eat something that's dead. Um, but we can still activate it. So now we have this, you know, ventral vagus, the, the, the nucleus and vagus that kind of allows us to have a stress response without shutdown. Mammals needed that because we are much more metabolically active. Uh, we can't have organ shutdown, that would be bad. However, society has gotten us into a point where we can get into this, this freeze, this play dead type state. And I want you to look at the words that describe it, dissociation, depression, helplessness, shame, Okay, so we talked about those things um, that create coherence and ones that don't. Um, and it's interesting to me that when we talk about this cognitive aspect of pain, um, that a large percentage of people who have chronic pain also have mental illness because they're in this, they're in this state here. And until we affect the state, we're never gonna get rid of the pain. Um, until we create coherence. Like, this is very incoherent. This is like a very incoherent. Like they're dissociated from society, right? They're not able to connect to other humans, which is exactly what's happening if a cell can't connect to another cell. You know, it starts to act selfishly. It doesn't know that there's people around, there's cells around it. So it starts to act as best for it rather than as best for the whole. This is really interesting work by um, uh, Marisu Emoto. Um, I remember I talked about structured water and how it's the majority of what makes up our, our, our body. Um, expressing positive words, love and gratitude to this water, and when you freeze it, you get these very pretty looking things. Um, and if you say hateful things, or you make sick, evil, whatever, you get this very incoherent water. Okay, so um, very, very relevant considering we are structured water. So, he'll have to describe it like this. Um, looking at the fascia, it's one body with many textures, differential movement without separation. And we saw that moving on the, on the video, you know, how, how fascia moves. Um, but what about when that becomes different organs, right? One body, many different textures, differential movement without separation. How about a group of people describing them that way? How about a bigger group of people? How about a bigger group of people? Right, this is coherence. So we affect coherence on a cellular level, for one body, you can affect it to the world. Um, I won't read this to you, although it's pretty cool. Uh, maybe I'll read the last bit of it here. Uh, the article concludes with the perspective that being responsible for and increasing our personal coherence is not only reflected in improved personal health and happiness, but it also feeds into and, into and is reflected in a global field environment. It is postulated that an increasing number of people add coherent energy to the global field, it helps strengthen and stabilize mutually beneficial feedback loops between human beings and Earth itself. Um, and it starts with the people in your office, right? Take them now. How many of you had a patient come in that was, I don't know, suicidal or grumpy and just uncooperative, and you start treating them, and they become the best patient you have? You can't wait for them to come in. Right? We've all seen that, and I think this is explaining how that happens. Um, now we do this too. You may have noticed said this too, but now comes the man. And any one man is a small thing. This man gives an adjustment. The adjustment is a small thing. The adjustment replaces the subluxation. That is a small thing. The adjusted subluxation releases pressure upon nerves. That is a small thing. The release pressure restores health to a man. That is a big thing for that man. Multiply that well man by a thousand and you step up physical and mental welfare of the city. Multiply that well man by a million and you increase the efficiency of the state. Multiply that well man by 130 million and you have produced a healthy, wealthy, and better race for posterity. So adjustment of the subluxation to release pressure upon nerves to restore mental impulse flow to restore health is big enough to rebuild, rebuild thoughts and actions of the world. You know who said that? He did. I don't know if he knew exactly how 
because I don't necessarily think it's pressed on nerves. I think it's just coherence and, and fashion and creating, um, I think the, the nerves is one aspect of it, but, um, but it's just really interesting that he said that. And I don't know about this, a girlfriend of mine uh, told me about it, that he said that. So what's the clinical approach? Um, affecting fascia, manipulation, right? Rhythmization, soft tissue manipulation, movement, especially to the point of creating heat, and, res and resolve on resolve as a store of past trauma. Because that can get stored in scar tissue, it can also get stored in water, and that interferes with communication. Hydrated fascia, we want toxin free, mineral rich, energized water, so we need the raw material to create um, hydration. Sunlight, I didn't, I didn't say this, but um, infrared light is the most, is the energy most absorbed by water, so it allows it to stretch itself the most. It's what Dr. Pollock found in his lab. Infrared light, and 42% of the sun's light are infrared. Grounding, um, if you look at the studies of uh, zeta potential around the red blood cell and the ability to space the red blood cell, um, that structured water on red blood cells and grounding does that. Light modalities, so a little of light therapy, infrared sauna, red light panels, um, just a few studies talking about some of those uh, infrared light exposure for someone's lifetime, the amount of scar tissue in the body, things they've looked at. Um, avoid toxins, so glyphosate especially has been shown to decrease the, the, um, how much water can structure itself. Minimize non native DMF exposure, that's also been shown to um, decrease the amount of structured water in the body by 10 to 15%. Eat good fats, uh, cold exposure, and express love and gratitude. So as chiropractors, can we educate on heart rate variability? Yes. Can we use light as a therapeutic to build force of water on all of them? Yes. Can we tell people to ground their body? Can we create photonics and sound and electrical energy and hydroelectric energy with biomanipulation? Yes. Can we help create more, a more, more coherent world? Yes. Now, just to touch on this um, leadership, since I'm talking to chiropractic leadership, um, healing relationships cannot be hierarch hierarchical. Every, everyone involved must be the same height and equally accessible, okay? This is a really good book, Leaders Equal Act, I really recommend it. Um, it should be the goal of leadership to set a culture free of danger from each other. And the way to do that is by giving people a sense of belonging, by offering them a strong culture based on a clear set of human values and beliefs, by giving them the power to make decisions, by offering trust and empathy, by creating a circle of safety. What does that sound like? Coherence, right? Create coherence in the people that you're leading. And you'll be amazed at where you get to. I really like this. I just heard it recently. Uh, there's Robert Kennedy, you know, giving a speech for running for independent. Um, Stop said this. Senator Edward Kennedy, my uncle Teddy, has his name on more pieces of legislation than any senator in United States history. He accomplished that because of his capacity to reach across the aisle. During weekends at Cape Cod, my uncle would bring home people who were his political rivals, people who were terrible, for example, and might issue him money. I looked at those people and I saw Darth Vader. And I would say to Teddy, why are you making these friendships? And he said, because I have a lot in common ground with you. I have a lot of common ground with them. They know the difficulties of living like a politician. And he always said to me, as much as I love our country, they love our country the same. We all believe in our country. We need to be able to talk to each other. And that allowed him to become the most productive senator in United States history. Cool, right? What was he doing? Creating coherence. Right? I love this quote. By fictional character. I guess it's JJ Carroll, but it's not our abilities to make us who we are, it is our choices. Right? So I just showed you what chiropractic can do. That's our abilities. But that's not going to make us who we are. It's not going to dictate where we get to as a profession. It's our choices. We have to create coherence in our profession to get where we need to be. Okay? So just a summary coherence is the ability of the body to effectively communicate and have energy every cell in the system on the same page. The heart is the only organ that can touch every cell in the body. Coherence of the entire body can be measured via heart rate variability. Proper body coherence is dependent on an intact collagen network, hydrated by four phase water, so the electrons, protons, phonons, protons and phonons can be conducted by communicators throughout the body. <coughs> Scar tissue, dehydrated collagen, interferes with the ability of the body to communicate and achieve coherence. Chiropractic creates a hydroelectric effect to finish the normal collagen. Light will also help hydrate this collagen into infrared light. Chiropractic creates coherence. This is most evident when we see the effects of chiropractic on heart rate variability, our best measure of coherence.
Effective leadership encourages coherent rather than utilizes power for control. The success of an entity is the ability to create coherence. So that's it. That's all I got. Um, so I'll be. I'll be around.